Over the last few decades, heritage studies have made great strides in theory and practical applications in many world regions, but the American field of public folklore remains little known. Today I will offer some insights gained as a public folklorist documenting, presenting, and preserving Florida's heritage. Since the mid-1980s, I have worked at state, regional, and local organizations which required diverse strategies to deal effectively with different demographics. I will leave theory to my esteemed colleague, Robert Barron, and before describing heritage practices in Florida, I will briefly sketch the larger context of public folklore. Today, a majority of American Folklore Society members identify as public rather than academically based folklorists. They work in government or nonprofit arts, cultural, or educational organizations, such as arts councils, historical societies, libraries, museums, or organizations devoted specifically to folk culture. The foundation for their work is continual field research, and the body of knowledge created by their cumulative work contributes to the sustainability, promotion, and preservation of our heritage. Since the 1980s, public folklorists have acknowledged that their practice may be viewed as intervention rather than pure observation. But more often than not, they work in collaboration with folk communities in order to sustain their traditions and curate interpretive programs. Some folklorists also work successfully within their own communities. Public folklore research often results in the non-stylized representation of culture through performances and demonstrations outside the original communities, such as festivals, concerts, or other events. This provides a platform for tradition bearers to interpret and represent their culture so that it may be appreciated by other sectors of society. And ultimately, ethnographic documentation contributes to archival collections, knowledge, and practice in areas as diverse as historic preservation, medicine, and foreign aid. Although public folk life programs are largely decentralized, the establishment of a network of allied organizations that address fundamental needs for funding, research, public presentation, and archival preservation has been essential to the successful, sustained efforts of public folklorists. American folklore studies coalesced in the late 19th century, and even in the early years, research and theory were addressed at both academic institutions and government agencies, such as the Bureau of American Ethnology. An important development was that, in response to the Great Depression, in 1933-35, to 35, the government enacted the New Deal, programs, public works projects, and financial reforms to create jobs and stimulate the economy. Employees of the Resettlement, Farm Security, and Works Progress administrations documented the music, speech, and art of ordinary Americans in many parts of the country, generating extensive collections now at the American Folklife Center. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, several important national organizations were founded. In 1967, the Smithsonian Institution's Center for Cultural Heritage in Washington, D.C. developed the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which presents traditional culture from the U.S., world, and selected folk groups. The center also produces exhibits, documentaries, symposia, publications, educational materials, and major national events, and it supports the Rinsler Folklife Archives and Collections, Folkways Records, ethnographic and policy-oriented research, and educational opportunities. In 1974, the National Endowment for the Arts Folk and Traditional Arts Program piloted the first folk arts programs at state arts agencies, leading to a dynamic network of state folk arts programs that brought new respect and funding for traditional culture. Folk and Traditional Arts also offers grants to nonprofit agencies, sometimes the only funding available to support local cultural expressions. Overall, it has had a major impact on the field by strengthening infrastructure and creating new programs. Their grants and pilot programs for folk arts apprenticeships fueled the growth of such programs throughout the United States. They also created national heritage fellowships. Based on the Japanese 
living national treasures, or individuals who preserve heritage, the fellowships are the most important honor in the field. They bestow greater recognition on folk arts and help maintain the vitality of traditions in culturally distinct communities. In 1976, the American Folklife Center was created at the Library of Congress uh, in order to preserve and present American folklife through research, documentation, archival preservation, reference services, performances, exhibition, publications, and training. It also provides online resources and guidelines for documentation, and it develops innovative projects. Its oral history initiatives include the Veterans History, Occupational Folklife, and Civil Rights History Projects. Encompassing millions of items, they have one of the largest archives of ethnographic and historical materials. The National Register of Historic Places, the official list of places considered worthy of preservation, is a part of an effort to identify, evaluate, and protect historic and archaeological resources. Although the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 only specified tangible resources, the 1980 amendments included a directive to study means of preserving and conserving the intangible elements of our cultural heritage, such as arts, skills, folk life, and folk ways, and to recommend ways to encourage the continuation of the diverse cultural traditions that underlie and are a living expression of our American heritage. The subsequent report, Cultural Conservation, recommended that traditional cultural resources with or without property reference be more systematically addressed in implementing the Act. UNESCO's heritage programs later adopted a similar approach which stress, stresses intangible cultural heritage. The National Council for the Traditional Arts is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to presentation and documentation through festivals, tours, symposia, exhibits, media productions, school programs, and cross-cultural exchanges its staff showcases the myriad folk, tribal, and ethnic cultures that comprise our nation. NCTA has created many multicultural festivals based on ethnographic research in conjunction with communities around the country. It has also produced public radio and television programs, recordings of a broad range of traditions, and it has worked with the National Park Service to develop the Blue Ridge Music Center. In addition to national agencies are those that serve various regions of the country, such as South Arts in the Southeast. They generally have at least one staff member specializing in traditional arts, and most offer funding or special initiatives to constituent agencies in their regions. Uh, South Arts offers programs like traditional arts touring grants, the Performing Arts Exchange, or the Folklorists in the South Retreat. State and local programs are more directly engaged than national ones in ongoing work with cultural groups. As I noted, state folk arts programs were established by NEA Folk Arts and many still receive NEA grants. Most function within arts agencies, but some are located in history or humanities agencies, universities, museums, or nonprofit organizations. They consider working with traditional communities to be essential to bridging cultural differences and building respect, civility, and understanding. State folklorists document folk culture, then make it accessible through various types of public presentations. Many programs serve communities on the margins of society, such as immigrants, laborers, people of color, or the elderly. Their efforts have helped to democratize and pluralize the concept of arts in the national consciousness. Although not as numerous as state programs, local programs operate in various organizational contexts. From folk arts organizations, such as Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago, or John C. Campbell Folk School in North Carolina, to ethnic organizations, local arts or social service organizations, and cultural centers. Many utilize folk arts to build relationships within communities or generate intercultural dialogue and understanding. Located in the American Southeast, Florida is a fascinating semi-tropical state with influences from Latin America, the Caribbean, and Northern US. In 1985, the Florida Folklife Program hired me to conduct an ethnographic survey of Miami with emphasis on Latin American culture. 
so I drove south to Miami through a blinding tropical storm. I was given an office at History Miami and found an apartment in the compound of the Skull Sisters, twin Cuban painters who dressed in styles evocative of 1950s Havana. Then I embarked on a quest to document South Florida's people and cultures. It was love at first sight. I marveled at the jumble of urban and rural, chickens roaming the streets of Hialeah, or tugboats hauling huge commercial ships past quiet, tiny suburban houses on the Miami River. The shady coolness of enormous ficus trees and the fantastic colors of tropical flowers contrasting with hot, gritty streets in industrial neighborhoods, the glitz of abundance next to the hopelessness of poverty, cultures colliding and merging, and towering above all, the clouds of the tropical Atlantic. It was the most complex place I'd ever been. It was a mess, and I've never had enough. As I later journeyed throughout Florida, I found countless other fascinating places with their own distinctive blends of culture and beauty. Not only is it blessed with a semi-tropical climate, beautiful natural inland areas, and 1,200 miles of sandy beaches, but Floridians are every bit as colorful and vibrant as the tropical foliage. History Miami has documented and presented culturally diverse Southeast Florida folklife for over 30 years, resulting in a plethora of exhibitions, publications, recordings, and events. In 1986, they received an NEA grant to hire a folklorist, so the museum asked me to return. From 1986 to 1991, I established their folklife program, beginning with a broader general survey of traditional culture, groups, and artists. It was followed by surveys on the Florida Keys, Latin and Caribbean music, African diaspora, and the Jewish community. Research provided the basis for exhibits such as Tropical Traditions, South Florida Folklife, or Haitian Sign Art in Miami. Our programs were collaborative and based on relationships forged with members of folk communities. They participated in events, workshops, exhibits, or other programs designed to provide examples of culture that would inspire intra-community pride and generate greater inter-community understanding. One of those programs was the Folk Arts in the School program. In the mid-1980s, Haitian immigrants were streaming into Miami in search of better economic opportunities, and they often accepted low-paying jobs. African Americans had long insisted on higher pay, so they responded with hostility, and there was racial and class prejudice from other sectors of society. It was so bad that some children denied that they were Haitian. I hope to improve intergroup relations by generating greater cultural appreciation via classes on traditional arts, including many Haitian arts. In cooperation with the Miami School District, I developed a curriculum and presented courses in local schools for several years. Eventually, I became the curator of the Artifact Collection, which allowed me to use connections in cultural communities to enrich the museum's collection. Many community partnerships resulted. Perhaps the oddest was with the coroner's office, which called unexpectedly to see if I would be interested in a room full of Afro-Caribbean religious artifacts that were confiscated at crime scenes. Once the police had examined and cleared them of illegal, illegal acquisition or use, the owners were contacted, but few reclaimed them. I accepted and then collaborated on identifying the objects with a Cuban-American anthropologist who was teaching the police about Afro-Cuban religions. The Florida Folklife Program is the state agency tasked with documenting, presenting, and preserving the state's traditional culture. For over 40 years, it has increased awareness through programs such as Folklife Apprenticeships, Folk Heritage Awards, exhibits, documentaries, publications, research, and special events or projects. Florida is the only state with an official state folklorist, a position in which I served for over a decade. It also defines folk life in state statutes as an integral part of historic preservation. And I believe that this, combined with its location in the Bureau of Historic Preservation, endowed it with greater long-term stability than many similar programs. Constant inquiry into the changing dynamics of traditional communities is the foundation of the Folklife Program. Thus, it conducts annual surveys on a chosen topic to increase knowledge about folklife and its practitioners. 
identified traditions and artists are featured at the Florida Folk Festival and also feed into other programs. An essential tool in sustaining culture is the apprenticeship program, which stresses not only continuation of skills, but also the knowledge and values that are an essential underlying cultural context. The master artist and student belong to the same folk group so that they grasp the context use and significance, and so that the apprentice will maintain the tradition within the community. The program has included a great diversity of arts and peoples, with many going to minorities. Its impact often endures as many teams continue working together and some students become professionals and teachers. And the program recognition often leads to further opportunities for the artists. Folk Heritage Awards recognize outstanding stewardship of Florida's living traditions. Established in 1985, the program is modeled after the National Heritage Fellowships. Based on public nominations, these awards are annually presented to tradition bearers and folk life advocates who have made long-standing contributions to the preservation of Florida's traditional heritage. Since it is difficult to reach 22 million with in-person programming, we develop strategies to reach them remotely. Voices of Florida, with eight audio portraits of cultural communities, was broadcast on public radio stations throughout the state. Segments examine topics such as cattle ranching, Southeast Asian communities in Central Florida, the South Florida Cuban community, and more. Another radio series, Music from the Sunshine State, presents music drawn from field and commercial recordings and interviews with artists. Another strategy was traveling exhibitions. I worked collaboratively with the Museum of Florida History staff to create Florida Cattle Ranching, 500 Years of Tradition, and Just Above the Water, Florida Folk Arts. I wrote the texts and curated artifacts, then they produced the physical exhibits and traveled them around the state. And the Florida Music Train is an engaging course that integrates information about musical heritage with state curricula in language arts, music, and social studies at elementary and secondary levels. It includes a CD of 23 recordings of traditional music, five lesson plans, a poster, and information about the artists and musical traditions. After working with History Miami and the Florida Folklife Program, which both served millions of constituents, I wanted to utilize my professional skills to create a more holistic, substantial, and lasting impact upon sustaining traditional culture, which meant working in a relatively small community. To that end, I became the Curator of Arts and Historical Resources for the city of Tarpon Springs. My work was greatly facilitated because I am Greek American and was accepted as a member of the Greek community. I live and work in Greektown and my local social network is largely within the community, which led to many opportunities for collaborative work. Tarpon Springs has a rich Greek heritage based on the community that was associated with the sponge industry, but some traditional arts had declined and there was limited public information on its culture. I created a multi-pronged approach to cultural sustainability through documentation, preservation, and presentation of local history and traditional culture, primarily Greek, but I also dealt with other communities. To that end, the Center for Gulf Coast Folklife focused on local Gulf Coast and Florida culture through activities based in ethnographic research. The Greek Community Documentation Project goals were to collect images, recordings, and other materials reflecting the history and heritage of the Greek community, make them available, and educate the public through interpretive websites, programs, and exhibits. In collaboration with the University of South Florida Library, we created an online exhibit featuring historical images and other items collected from community members as well as more recent photos and videos. The partnership with USF ensures long-term preservation and availability. Dancing as One is a 50-minute documentary about the Greek community whose culture had not previously been presented in video format by community members. It features several individuals whose lives are intertwined with such major aspects of local culture as religious customs, sponge fishing, music, and dance. 
The production team included videographer Costa Lekas, director Eleni Christopoulos Lekas, and me as producer. Dancing as One premiered in March 2019 at St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral's Community Center to a packed house, and it was later shown on the Tampa Public Television Station. We offered museum exhibits that interpreted local, state, and regional culture. I curated eight original temporary exhibits, including Greek music in America, Florida maritime traditions, Latin American folk culture in Florida, sacred arts, African American folk arts, and more, as well as a permanent exhibit on the Greek community. A community photographer also created exhibits on the Greek community. In addition, we displayed Smithsonian traveling exhibitions on immigration and work, for which I created programs that highlighted local culture. In terms of events, Night of the Islands recreated the atmosphere of a Panagiri with outdoor dining on the sponge docks, local bands, and Greek social dancing. Embraced by Greeks throughout the area, it was an important community event for nine years. It was highly collaborative, with decisions made by a team of city staff, restaurateurs, and music groups, eventually leading to more harmonious relationships between them. Salsa on the Sponge Docks was a similar event uh, based in Latin music. Folklife workshops preserve traditions by making knowledge and skills more available. Offerings included Greek bazooki, violin, percussion, clarino, tsabuna, lauto, Greek and Latin cooking classes, Byzantine chant, and Kalimnian song. Bazooki workshops were particularly successful. Several students now perform publicly. For various initiatives, I also developed concerts featuring different types of Greek music, collaborating with musicians to assemble ensembles and generate playlists that best conveyed the genre. Concerts included Rebetica, Xenitia, Café Aman, Dodecanese Music, Songs of Struggle, and others. As one of Florida's few remaining working waterfronts, the Sponge Docks is a perfect venue to showcase maritime folk life. I conducted field work and then invited participants to demonstrate. For several years, this free Gulf Maritime Festival featured sponge diving and processing, diving helmets, mullet fishing, cast nets, stone crab traps, shrimping, fish smoking, clam farming, boat building, and other maritime skills. Staged interview st sessions provided maritime workers with a platform to discuss their work and problems. In collaboration with the Florida Humanities Council, I developed the Tarpon Springs Greek Town Walking Tour. Through an app downloaded onto a phone or tablet, it provides viewers with images and narration about the history and culture of the Greek Town District at 10 stops along the tour route. As previously noted, historic preservation provides an opportunity to preserve and demonstrate the significance of cultural heritage through listings on the National Register, or NR. Long known for its emphasis on buildings, the NR now also encourages traditional cultural property, or TCP, nominations. A TCP is associated with cultural practices or beliefs of a living community that are rooted in that community's history and are important in maintaining the continuing cultural identity of the community. In 2014, I submitted a nomination to the NR, and Tarpon Springs Greek Town Historic District became Florida's first traditional cultural property listed and the nation's first non-Indigenous TCP district. When I arrived, Tarpon Springs had not surveyed or listed Greek Town, its most unique district, so I conducted extensive fieldwork, then worked closely with NR staff and the State Historic Preservation Office because no model existed for a TCP district nomination. I formed a working group of residents who helped determine boundaries, document the continuation of traditional culture, and relate cultural practices to physical sites in a residential and commercial district with about 400 resources, mostly buildings, but also sponge boats. They even identified a building type unknown outside the district, tiny sponge divers' cottages, known as skila spitia, or dog houses, because they lacked plumbing. The residents spent their time on the boats or at nearby Caffinea, so they did not need such amenities. 
Upon completion, the nomination was circulated for approval to the Greek Community Municipal Historic Preservation Board and Board of Commissioners, Florida Historic Preservation Review Board, and then the NR. But there were problems. The city had acquired funds to improve the sponge docks, the most touristic area. Briefly, their architectural plans would have turned it into a landscaped tourist sidewalk with staged cultural shows. They wanted to push the dock farther into the river and install a problematic wooden rather than cement dock. The inadequate workspace would have made it difficult for the sponge fleet to survive. The city manager insisted on proceeding because the plans had been expensive. It was finally stopped in part by Greek community opposition as they recognized the threat to their heritage. And importantly, when the district became eligible for the National Register, the Director of Compliance and Review in the Bureau of Historic Preservation refused to grant a permit to change the docks because the narrowed waterway would endanger sponge fishing. To proceed, the city needed a Section 106 review with a likely negative outcome. In this case, the cultural integrity of the sponge docks was threatened because the city and architect were insensitive to Greek community interests. They privileged artificial displays of culture over the organic practice of culture, and their development paradigm was oriented towards tourism and business rather than general community interests. As cultural specialists, we may be able to encourage place-rooted development that preserves not only buildings, but also their authentic cultural context, including the cultures of the poor, such as sponge fishermen or other marginalized groups. Again, it is crucial to work closely with communities to understand their needs. In 2018, I nominated Cicadia Cemetery to the NR as a TCP. Although not contiguous with the Greek town district, Cicadia is part of the cultural complex. Greeks and Greek Americans represent a large component of existing burials and the majority of incoming burials. Cicadia has an extensive area containing grave markers with Greek stylistic elements and decorative accessories, as well as Greek funerary customs that are performed in the cemetery. This funerary culture is shared with Greece and especially with the Dodecanese Islands. In addition, many markers reflect an evolving synthesis of American styles with Greek cultural elements, and some aspects, such as the sponge industry imagery, do not occur elsewhere in the U.S. Cicadia Cemetery was listed on the NR as a TCP in March 2019, as a site where community members maintained Greek burial practices and religious rituals. The NR does not want to list all U.S. cemeteries, only those with unusual or important cultural and historical significance, like Cicadia. Yet the focus on Greek cultural history, necessary to secure a place on the NR, angered some non-Greek residents and was the reason why the chair of the city's Historic Preservation Board voted against the nomination. I have included this information about opposition to historic preservation projects because it is important to acknowledge that social meaning and values can be fluid and contested. We may assume that our efforts contribute to the general social good and to the well-being of a traditional community, but many groups contend for power, economic benefits, or simply attention, and if they perceive others garnering more favorable status, they may contest or denigrate our efforts in order to defend their own status. Perhaps the only course of action is to persist while remaining sensitive to these issues. Since April 2019, I have worked as an independent public folklorist on projects with state, national, and international dimensions. One of them, the Greek Music in America Archives Project, is a collaboration with the Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana University. With a grant from NEA, a team of Greek music specialists are identifying, collecting, contextualizing, and making accessible a collection of Greek music recorded in America or by American companies in Greece from 1896 to the recordings encompass not only traditional music, but also emerging urban genres, songs of social commentary, stylistic changes, 
and reflections of the daily lives of immigrants, and they are invaluable documents of community practices. They are doubly important because the music generated in the U.S. has had an enduring influence on that of Greece and other diaspora communities. The collection includes about 1,800 items in multiple formats and associated ephemera such as catalog, sheet music, or images. At this time, there is no other comprehensive, publicly accessible collection of Greek recordings. Since the 1970s, public folklore, which is little known outside the U.S., has developed an array of practices and strategies that may serve as useful models for those engaged in cultural heritage work. Of particular interest is the emphasis on decentralized and collaborative work with traditional communities, often enabling increased local agency in the creation of cultural programming.